Welcome back to Palisade Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics, and joining me today is returning guest Jaime Carrasco. He's a portfolio manager for Canaccord. Thanks for joining me today, Jaime. Thanks for having me back and what times we're living through. Absolutely. I wanted to get you back to update us and really get an idea of how the uh, the hashtag that we that we premiered last time we spoke of hedge accordingly, how that has how your thinking around that has maybe changed since the last time we spoke. Well, I think it has, and I think it's it's a perfect hatch, and that's why I've been using it constantly since we last spoke, because it makes a lot of sense. Now, let me back up a bit. Last week, you guys had an excellent interview with DiMartino Booth, who truly understands the mechanics of the Fed and what they've been doing, most central, all central banks. Now, at one point, though, she says that we are living in unprecedented times. I would disagree with that. It is unprecedented in what's happening right now because the amount of money that's being printed is just unbelievable. Like, you know, we're, we're doing what? A trillion every two months or so now when it took 100 years to get to one trillion? It's just crazy. These are a crazy amount of, of, of money. Now, if we look at history, though, you see some repetitive factors of central banks' excesses going crazy, especially today when, we live, when we're living in, in, in a fiat currency system. Uh, I think that if you can follow history all the way back, the 1770s was the last time that we worked in a non-fiat system and, the, the, and, and what happened. However, forget the history for a second and let's talk about the consequences of all this money printing. Throughout history, whenever central banks start to go crazy, the first problem is income inequality because a lot of that money that is printed filters through to only one or two sectors of the economy. So the net result is that we end up with the destruction of the middle class. It happened in my youth. It happened in Chile. It happened in Argentina. It happened in the German Republic. That is not different. That is a definite constant. And it explains a lot of the politics we're going through today. You know, in in 2016, I got in trouble with Scotiabank early on in the year because I said that Trump was going to win the election. I wasn't looking at polls. I was just looking at the populist wave that was being created because of those imbalances that central banks have been created. What what Trump is is just a reflection of a losing out middle class that has lost everything and they want another alternative than the political choice. Now, for this election, that's no different. I think that Trump is going to win in an amazing way because people have lost out even more. The middle class continues disappearing. And that is the result of central banks. Now, we don't want to talk about it, but there's some definite parallels that are occurring within the income inequality and the social, the the destruction of the social contract, I would say. And the only way back is, you know, we go through these periods throughout history. You know, again, I go back to the same reason that I got kicked out from BNN in, in 2016, the 30s are a great example. Both Churchill and Hitler were elected by their people, you know, and it was because they were the non-political choice, or at least the one that stood out out there, right? And that's no different this time. I think what's more important to understand is that as we go through these periods, the cleansing of these periods have always involved gold. So that's what I'm betting on, and that's why hedge accordingly is so important, because my point is is that investors have to have a percentage of their assets in the precious metal sector and physical gold or the producers, not the explorers, but they should have that to protect themselves from the inevitable loss of purchasing power of their savings. Let me put that very clearly. I'm old enough now that I recall when a million dollars would yield 100000 a year in income. Today, what? It's $15,000? Well, you need $10 million to get the same amount, if not, you know, that is the destruction of purchasing power. The problem is that people are seeing the stock market rise, but they're not realizing that on a, on a net basis, their wealth is rising, but not faster than the loss of purchasing power of their money. And that can clearly be seen in a chart that I post every Friday on my LinkedIn page where I'm showing the dis- or the spread that is being created between the precious metals, gold, silver, and the Dow itself – back to October 1, 2018. That date is important because that's when central banks started losing control of the yield curve. We'll put those in the the video as well, Jaime. As you're you're speaking about Trump being elected or coming into the election, how does this particular time in history and the delayed stimulus bill play into the systemic risk factor that we're seeing right now? Well, I think that it's important to understand that from my opinion, 
the way that, and this is my opinion, is that the avalanche has already begun unraveling. And there we can use a great historical quote from Hemingway, where, where in The Sun or Psoriasis, he asks one of the characters, one of the character asks the other character, how did you go bankrupt? Well, it was gradual and then suddenly. That process has already begun. The avalanche can be stopped from here on. We know that by the speeches given by Mark Carney two years ago at Jackson Hole and Trump himself at Davos last year that the currency reserve is about to be unwound. That's the U.S. dollar. That's a fact because the current system can't continue. Now, the real question is who's going to be in control of the new, the new currency reserve. Now, in my opinion, China is part of that equation. The real question is, do we end up with a SDR type of setup, according to the IMF, where we end up with a centrally planned type of government, or with an individual type of government representing more the, the people of that nation, as Trump is proposing? So that is what's at stake going forward, is do we wanna live in a, in a, in a centrally planned economy? Or do we want to live in more of a libertarian type of setup? I think it's, it's one of those two choices. Personally, I think that we have to look at the world more as historical travelers that were just stuck in the storm. Well, how do we set up for that? Regardless of who wins, gold wins. And I think that's important. That's why, again, hedge accordingly and have a percentage of your assets in precious metals. So, Jaime, as, you, as you're saying, the rebalancing of the world. And we've seen a lot of gold go from west to east since 2008. So what do you think about that power shift and, and how does that inform your decision making going forward? Well, very much so, because that's the number one uh, rule of power. He who holds the gold makes the rules the same way that the last time we went through this in 1933, the U.S. was able to control that process because they had the most gold of all central banks. If we look at, at central bank reserves, we're looking at about 37,000 tons. We know for a fact that China is sitting on 20,000 tons of those that have transferred over to Asia since 2008. Go figure. Why 2008? Well, in 2008, we know, for, we know that that gold started transferring because Chinese work in a metric system. So all the ingots that left the West were re-smelted from, kilo, from pound bars to kilo bars and transferred over. That's why we know that figure. So we know that they will hold the key in terms of the new currency reserve that is structured. If done through the IMF, I think we end up with some kind of a, of a Bretton Woods type of basket, whereby, and similar to the SDR that uh, James Rickards always talking about, whereby we all have one currency and the national currency will have a purchasing power in relation to the basket from within, but China would have the greater the, the greater amount of, of purchasing power. If Trump wins, I think what we end up with is more of a geopolitical structure similar to after the Berlin Wall, where you will have three distinct geographical locations with Asia being run by China with their currency and their purchasing power, the U.S. backed by their 9,000 tons, a new U.S. dollar, which is good for Canada, by the way, because I'd rather be in that, in that system than the other. And then Europe falls on its own, and they, they're restructuring themselves um, accordingly within, within whatever amount of gold is left for them. So if you follow gold and follow the process by which currency reserves have always been reset, the balance of gold is important in terms of how the power structure is shared. I don't think that's going to be any different anymore. And I think, you know, if you look at, at, at the consequences of what's coming ahead, as these currencies revalue, well, we're going to see the loss of purchasing power of all currencies, including the currency reserve itself, the dollar. Jaime, I mean, just to just to clarify there, as you're speaking about the the upcoming changes and you're talking about the libertarian or or free market type system versus the more centrally planned type system that is somewhat contingent on trump winning to you of course of course the 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 democrats would definitely fall in line with the europeans and Canada and follow through with some kind of a un setup where we all share in everything Right. But the problem is, is that we're losing a national sovereignty and that's going to be part of the cost of that setup. If Trump wins, well, forget that. I think that if, if we look at it, if we're looking at a, at a at Trump win the way I think it's going to be, where he's going to win the Senate and the House and the White House, 
well, I think we're going to have a definite restructuring of the U.S. First of all, if that is the case, the U.S. dollar is toast. The U.S., there is no MAGA with a U.S. dollar. We have had some manufacturing come back to the U.S., but it'll never come back with the currently purchasing power of the dollar versus the other currencies. It has to be annihilated to really have the manufacturing come back. On top of that, we have to be realistic, and that also means that he's going to take on Wall Street. Because in my opinion, from the eyes of, of the libertarians, Wall Street itself is, is just a lot of multinational companies that are not supplying manufacturing for Americans. That's why we have such income disparity within the U.S. itself, where 1% owns 95% of the assets and 95% of the people, well, they're, they're losing out. And I think that's a reason why Trump is, is going to win. Now, also, I think he's going to cut taxes, because what a better way to drain the swamp than cut the funding of the government, right? especially the federal government. What we end up with, though, is a, is a massive inflationary storm, because at the same time, he's going to get the Treasury to start sending checks to Americans to keep things going. So in essence, we are going to go through a massive inflationary storm, whereby I think the Dow could easily end up $50,000 range or so. But the same thing with Biden, with a, with a big difference, in that the, the decisions internally within the U.S. are not going to be 100% made by, the, by, by Americans. They're going to be made by more of a centrally gov- uh, central government where we are all beholden to people that are, we're not voting for. As most of us know that all these systems or all these problems were already, you know, really inherent in the system before COVID hit. But did did the central banks really need COVID to to dump all this liquidity into the system? Well, it definitely helped. <laughs> <laughs> Think about what would have happened if we didn't have this. You know, all it's done, it's it's put a Band-Aid over over the problems that had already begun in October. Right. But. But going forward, they're definitely telling us that they don't have any solutions. What did, why did gold run up in, in, in July? Because they pretty well have said that they'll do whatever it takes. In essence, they've lost control of the yield curve, right? All they can do is print money going forward. And that is important because now it's, it's the Argentina, Brazil, Chile, the Burkina Republic replaying from this point on. And that's why gold has been rising. Now, keep in mind that at the beginning of the year, I did say that most people will not understand why gold is going up. The reality is, in, from my eyes, is that they've not only are they losing control of that pricing mechanism because of the leverage they've been applying just can't be applied anymore because they don't have the physical left. They don't have control of the physical. On top of that, the regulator seems as though they're finally regulating. With, we've seen what's happened with these. It happened to a number of banks that have been fined some big bucks. You know, JP Morgan just paid, what, close to a billion dollars for spoofing the market? Well, I think that is also indicative that the game is afoot. And so going forward, I think they can't lower the price anymore. They, they, all they can do is control the ascent of the price. And because of that, I think we have to hedge accordingly because of the leverage that has been applied to that break within the price. And it's that very same break that Terry Duffy, the head of the chairman, warned about three years ago. And I keep posting that, that warning where he said that three years ago, the price of gold would have been five to $7,000. Now, the real question is why has this, has this been done? Would Americans and the world and investors around the world be running into the Dow the way they are without question if gold was sitting anywhere near three or four thousand dollars? No, they wouldn't. So it's it, it, in essence, it's exactly what I said all along that by playing with the price of gold, they're shutting down the systemic alarm of gold. But because systemic uh, systemic risk continues rising, well, gold is being bought. Even Warren Buffett has come in now, which is great. But, but if you think about it, he's nowhere near where he should be. There was something that I had read that there was 40,000 tons available for investors around the world on top of the 37,000 tons that are controlled by central banks. Okay? So let's think about that for a second and look at that in the content of Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, everybody, the, the big news was that he had bought 11 million shares of Barrick. Okay? Well, 11 million shares of Barrick is only less than half of 1% of his portfolio. I think it's 0.2%. That's not enough. If he's buying gold, considering who his father was, he understands why he's buying it because there's inflation coming. Now, in order to hedge his portfolio, he has to get it to at least 5%. 
So let's think about that for a second. There's 40,000 tons of physical gold available for everybody in the world, every investor, okay? But 40,000 tons at uh, uh, $1,900, that equates to about $2.5 trillion. Now let's look at asset allocation for a second. We have equity markets globally of about 90 trillion, and we have debt of about 250 trillion. If we add up those two numbers and we decided, okay, everybody will have at least a 5% allocation into gold, that's $17 trillion. Well, 2.5 and 17 trillion entering, that's massive rush of money. That's the maverick, that's a tsunami that I've been surfing and that I wanna surf through my producers. And that's why I'm positioning myself because that is inevitable. Smart money knows that they need to hedge themselves. Even uh, Leon Cooperman, First time he's bought gold. Why do you think he's buying gold? For the same reason that I keep advising clients to hedge accordingly. I love how that phrase keeps coming up, Jaime. I, I want to step back a bit, though, to something you were saying about losing control of the yield curve. And I had a conversation recently about the guest was talking about having uh, basically controlling the yield curve and, and capping it. And obviously, we all know that the interest rates can't go up. If, if the interest rates go up, the U.S. is not going to be able to service that debt. So is that something that is, uh, again, tied into that into that systemic risk of losing confidence in the dollar? Most definitely, because you got to understand as well that we have this guy, Trump. Now, the way I see Trump, he's just the guy that intercepted the ball in 2016 and is running with it with his own game plan. But part of that game plan as well is to deal with the Fed. So let's look at what he's done throughout this year. Well, first of all, the Treasury is in control of the money printing. Why do you think Mnuchin's talking to, to Pelosi? Because they're printing money now. The Fed is not in control. All the Fed is doing is buying up debt, printing money to buy debt. So they become the net buyer of debt, which, by the way, is extremely concerning because now they're also printing money to maintain expenses. So that is exactly what Germany was doing in the 30s, and we know the consequences of that. Okay, So if you look at, at what Trump has done throughout the year, he set everything up to start really neuter the Fed, but also start printing money straight to people. Now, that's highly inflationary, because between 08 and Trump, all of that money that was issued was given to the banking sector to keep it alive. They were supposed to loan it out, but it hasn't really filtered through. It stayed with, within the, that one sector, and they benefited greatly from all that money. The big difference now, though, is that the money is going to enter straight to, the, in, straight to Americans, and that's why the, the, the changes that have occurred are so important. Now, also, the fact that Treasury itself is handling the money, that's very important because that is exactly what was happening before the creature from Tre Jekyll Island came to be. The Treasury was in charge. So in essence, he's pretty well setting things up. And then, by the way, we have uh, Judy Shelton is still in, in the running for the, for the Fed, even though everything's quiet down. And I think that'll spark up after the election as well. But again, that's another piece of the puzzle to set up a system whereby the, the Fed is no longer in control. But what are the consequences of that? The best analogy in history that I can look at that is Perón, uh, not Evita, but her husband, because what he was doing, why Argentinians loved him, was because he, he was actually printing money and giving it straight to Argentinians. The problem, though, is that that's, again, going to kill the dollar. So you have to look at the puzzle, how it's set up going forward. No matter what, we have to unwind the system and redo it. I think that those critical points are non and very near, and that's why I think the avalanche has already begun on COVID-19. All it's, all it's done is, is allowed more money printing to keep the system going a little bit longer. So you actually hit one of my next points, Jaime, was I wanted to get your thoughts on the dollar milkshake theory and, and debate that we've had going on. Uh, you think the dollar is going much lower? Oh, I, the, the, the dollar's going the way of the dodo. The, the currency reserve system that we have is going to be non-existent in the near future. That is a fact. It's whether it's done, it happens like, like an avalanche or overnight like, like uh, Roosevelt does in 1933 or Nixon did in 70, 71 or 75. The problem is they're not going to tell us. You just have to hedge accordingly and be ready for it. That's why... I'm not trading the precious metals. I'm, I'm, to me, you know, trying to book a profit on any of my precious metals positions, which were bought back in 2015, would be like selling my seat on the lifeboat of the Titanic to book a profit. Well, that's a Darwin Award to me. No, I think the dollar is, is going to disappear. And I think, well, 
again, if Biden wins, the dollar will have more life for now. But if Trump wins, I think the dollar will be disappearing rather quickly. The dollar as a currency reserve, that is, which is important because if the currency reserve is going to go through what is what I think is going to go through, the other fiat currencies are going to depreciate even faster because they're all tied to that dollar. I'd like to turn a little bit to Canadian investors. And, and something you posted recently was, was a chart from Crescott Capital showing uh, a massive spike in the Canadian central bank balance sheet. So what are the consequences of that for Canadian investors? And maybe you could contrast that to what, the, what we've seen out of the U.S. as well. The, the problem right now in Canada is that, again, the solutions to everything is just more taxes or more printing. What it really means for Canadians, though, is that we have to we are going to have to live with a much greater tax bill going forward, because how are we going to pay for all this and greater, greater devaluation of the Canadian dollar or its purchasing power. So it's going to cost even more. One of the problems with Canada is that we don't have any gold left. There's nothing back in our currency. So we are a leaf in the wind. That's another reason why for my Canadian clients, I urge them to make sure that they have precious metals positions because it's going to hedge them best. You know, that's already happened because what? Gold in Canadian dollars is sitting at $2,700. Well, it was at par with uh, the U.S. dollar back in 2011, and they were both at 1900 Well, now it would be great to have the, the gold in, in U.S. dollars at 2700 Well, it's in Canadian. Now that's really good for the Canadian gold companies and and because they're producing what at 600 Canadians. So their profitability is going through the roof. And what's the benefit of that? Dividend. So the dividend increases of of the companies uh, has been great. And I think this coming quarter is going to be even better because the the quarterly earnings that are coming through now, I believe the average cost was about $1,600. Well, the average cost for the quarter after that is going to be 1,900. So, uh, you know, I, I expect much from my producers. And the nice thing is nobody owns them yet. Right. So I have new clients coming in on a regular basis and we're able to set up positions for them and start hedging their portfolio. Now, what do I hear from my colleagues is that uh, I'm making money on high tech. I'm making money on, on a lot of other areas. Well, you know, that logic didn't apply too well when Nortel was continued to go up in the year 2000. We all know what happened to that. So so why would I be advising clients to jump into something that has already made its money? I'd rather be buying the area that nobody owns that is extremely profitable and about to get even more profitable. Interesting, Jaime. Since we last spoke in June, how have you rebalanced within your portfolios? Well, uh, oddly, it's funny you ask me that because the one thing I did was now that silver has finally joined the party, I I, I actually uh, took some profits on some of the gold companies. And I started to add more silver to my portfolios. So I bought another silver company, which actually benefited greatly because I did that before the price spiked. And, you know, I, I think silver at 24 bucks, it's, it's ridiculously cheap with gold near 1900. Silver has way more upside. So I've, I've reallocated into silver. Continue to hold my blockchain place because I think blockchain is an unbelievable technology that will be part of the future. And that has about a 7% weighting and that I've, I've held and, and just rebalance accordingly, right? Not all companies are moving at the same, at the same rate. I like them all, all the companies that I have, but what's good about rebalancing is that it allows us to trim back the ones that are doing well and buy back into the ones that, that have uh, not yet performed. So it allows me to buy more of the ones that, that haven't moved yet, but also take profits on the other ones. So rebalancing by the way, is 80% of a portfolio's long-term return. It's not trying to trade the market. It's about properly positioning. Uh, the problem with trading is that, hey, gold hasn't gone down to the level that a lot of the technical guys have been saying yet. Well, are they going to be able to get in on time? And what if overnight we run out of physical? And you actually add up the, look at the physical leverage, how many days are short, have way more concerns from that perspective in terms of the demand for true physical versus all of those paper contracts that are floating out there. I think sooner or later, we're going to have force majeure. And when that happens, if you don't have your positions, well, you're going to be waking up with much higher gold and silver prices than than, than the weekend before. And that's going to be driven purely from basically the COMEX, correct? 
Yes. Well, the COMEX and the LBMA, they're both having trouble delivering and um, um, massive issues. You know, October, what, uh, the average contract delivery for October is 5,000 contracts, and we're looking at 37, I think it was, for this for this month that they have to scrounge to get the physical, right? Uh, so so, so look, at, look at that paper game for a second, right? And, and let's kind of try to figure out the leverage for a bit. If you just look at the physical content of the COMEX right now, I think the last I checked, it was about 106 days of global gold production short. I mean, let, let's get that clear, okay? In essence, if we run out today, we need 106 days just to come up with that amount. Well, now let's start adding up the leverage, which last I checked, it's tracking, you know, when you look at uh, Ed Steer's work, he's saying 100 to 1. Some other ones are saying greater than, greater than that, but let's keep it at 30 to 1, which was the leverage of the banking system in 2008. Well, now we're looking at, at 3,000 days of global gold production to meet that. And now let's add all of the ETFs that are paper contracts out there. And now you start to see how quickly we run out of gold and how many days of global gold production we will require to meet that physical demand. Because trust me, when this game is over, that paper contract that you had is null and void. You're going to get the price at 1900 but not that's not going to be the price when you try to buy the actual physical, right? It's going to be much greater. So that leverage to me is, is, is amazing if I'm holding on to my producers because, again, history is completely repeating the 30s. When everybody, even though they, they had, even though in the U.S., you know, if you look at Homestake Mining and, and, uh, and Alaska Juno, the demand for physical went through the roof, their profitability goes through the roof, the dividend goes through the roof, they're paying out about 10% right through that period. They were the best hedge. But the problem was that you couldn't get that physical because it had to come out of the ground. And as the, the physical comes out of the ground, the producers are the best, become some of the best investments as we're going through that whole rebalancing of the monetary system. Exactly, because they're, they're holding the best assets out there in the, in the best possible vault they can, right? Exactly. There's no better gold than the, the vault and the gold on the ground. So, and then that, by the way, good, good, I'm glad you pointed that out because, you know, if you look at reserves on the ground, well, I just finished picking up a, a silver company with five, I think it was six million ounces of silver on the ground at about $3 an ounce silver on the ground. To me, that's dirt cheap. So, you know, go back to 2011. In 2011, I got taken out of, uh, of Trelawney. Well, Fruta del Norte. Fruta del Norte was about the Aurelian play was, what, $110 an ounce gold on the ground? Right right now, gold on the ground is trading, what, at about 20 bucks, $25 maybe? Right when you look at some of the exploration plays with gold and what they're, what they're trading at. So it's ridiculous values. I think it's, it's, it's an amazing sector that nobody's really looking at yet, but I think they will have to. And the smart money is definitely noticing, even though they've been saying that, you know, I'm, I'm talking about Warren Buffett, such a barbaric a- asset. Well, it is barbaric and it's been around forever for a reason, right? Because it's when we need to rebuild the monetary system, it's the only thing that we can all trust. And, it, and it's funny how you talk about the ridiculous valuations, but that's meant in a positive way, in a very asymmetrical way. And it seems like the exact opposite to, let's say, the valuations of these fan, fang stocks and and, um, and these zombie companies well, I, that are that are so prominent in the U.S. right now and just being propped up by all the stimulus, correct? Oh, exactly. You know, it goes back to one of my, my, the first rules I learned at Gordon Capital. There were two rules. Once when everybody gets it, there's no money to be made. But more importantly was that the wealth is a blob on a platter and that platter is moving from one side to the other, right? So it's tilting. So you get an overweight of the blob on one side and then the blob comes back to the other side. That tilt, (laughs) it's almost a 90 degrees and about to start coming back the other way. All I'm doing is positioning myself on the other side and, you know, when... I, I I know some people that when they're calling me that they want to buy gold, well, I'll consider taking some profits, but it's we're long from that, right? Because the blob is just starting to come back my way. And again, it goes right through investor psychology. Who is it? Uh, Dines. Alan Dines. You know, he always goes on. He's been around for years, but he always goes on about investor psychology and how you just have to play against it, right? And that's what I've been doing. And that's why you're hashtag hedging accordingly, right? 
Exactly. <laughs> and and I'll actually, let's go back to history because there is one more that I, I haven't used much, but I think I'm going to start. Follow the yellow brick road. You know, people forget that the Wizard of Oz was an allegory so that we don't forget the importance of gold. Dorothy's slippers were supposed to be silver, right? Not, not red. That was for Hollywood. But the allegory itself is about the importance of gold within the monetary system. And that's why the, the scarecrow was agriculture. The lion was banking. And the steel guy, the, the metal guy, was manufacturing, right? The tin man, it was manufacturing. Again, history is full of these little nuggets that have been left behind so that we don't make the same mistakes again. And this time, we have made the same mistake, mistake again on a global basis, right? So what I'm trying to do is just position myself to make it through that storm, and I think we've already gone through the worst, and now we're, we're sailing with, uh, at least my clients, we're sailing with the wind behind us because those allocations are, are really protecting our assets. Uh, we're seeing it in the, both in the equity income portfolio, which is the one for more older people with income. Well, those, all of those funds are in the money, and you know they didn't, they didn't suffer much through the March decline or, or all of these declines, and the, the future looks bright. Same thing with the, with equity inc- the, the special opportunities portfolio, which is my precious metals and a little bit of blockchain portfolio. They're volatile. You know, we, can't, we have to live with the volatility because we're sailing through a storm. You are going to get wet. Right, but we're going to make it through, and now the the winds are back uh, at least. Absolutely, and and hopefully, as as we can try and educate more people about this and show them the allegory, like 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 the Wizard of Oz, and get more people on this side, it's only going to benefit them and in turn us as well, because that blob is really going to start turning once we educate more people. Correct. Uh, correct. Correct. Right, and and that's all I'm trying to do is just point out how I see the world, which is a little bit different. And by the way, I haven't changed my tune since, what, 2015 now, 2016, I've been saying that this storm is building. Because in 08, I understood that all they did was kick the can down the road, but it, it, it created one problem, because who's going to bail out the governments? And that's the key. Now back to Trump, the, the world as it sets up going forward between a global government or individual governments, well, who's going to bail them out? That is the problem. That is the challenge that we face today. And what is the future going to be like? I, I couldn't agree more, Jaime. Do you have anything else you'd like to, to touch on before we wrap up here? Yeah, just one last one last historical point that's very important with the coming election going forward and, and why I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic of America itself. And I would take Churchill's line of, you know, Americans sooner or later do the right thing. Because if you look at the history of America, the history of the U.S., well, the U.S. comes to be because of the last time we messed up with a fiat currency system, the 1770s, John Law, right, where the gold standard is finally set. Well, that gives birth to the U.S. Prior to that, that point of history, the republics didn't exist. We were all subservience of a king. Right? All of a sudden, we have a vote. What do you mean we have a vote? Oh, I can vote? What about my king? Well, forget the king. We're a republic now. So think about the social change that occur. Well, the one gift that the framers gave us is the U.S. Constitution, because from a, from a political perspective, that, that social contract, that social document is the best document for a proper civil society. Yes, uh, you know, we have all of these uh, historical revisionists today saying that, you know, they, it was only for the white guys. Well, that's fine if it was written for the white guys who control the power then. What's important is we just have to apply the day, you know, for all the people, for everybody, not just black lives, Latino lives, indigenous lives, white lives, Anglo lives, everybody, right? But the contract itself that created the U.S., that built the, the social structure that has been with us for the last 200 years, I would not throw that baby out with the bathwater because that is, to me, the most important document that had really built the, the social contract that, was, that built the world after the 1770s. The whole Industrial Revolution, by the way, you know, was built on a sound money system. But the, the new republics were built with that contract, with that social contract behind it. And that's what created the U.S. And that's why I'm very optimistic, the U.S. I think Americans understand their history, even though they're going through this, through this storm right now. 
But I think eventually they, they find the right, you know, uh, I'm going to be more like Churchill and say that sooner or later they will, they do the right thing. Well, Jaime, I, I always appreciate your, your historical perspective on these things and I appreciate your time as always. Thanks very much. And I would like to say that you guys are doing stellar work. There's some really good interviews you've been doing and keep it up, man. Thanks very much, Jaime. And we can uh, always find more of you and, and your posts that I find very valuable on, on LinkedIn and also on Twitter, IJ Carrasco, correct? Yes, IJ Carrasco and uh, my, my LinkedIn thing that I don't know by heart. I thank you for having me once more, and I hope I'm helpful to all your listeners. Absolutely, Jaime. We're, we always value uh, getting to chat with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers. And a happy Thanksgiving to everybody. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?